Well, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a talk on Embrace New Strategic Thought with P.D. Josh, Professor Chair Digital Learning, IM Bangalore. To start with, um, you know, I'm just reminded of a conversation I had with somebody. We were talking about how does the world change around us. But before I go, how much time do I have? Because now obviously it's not 20, 30 minutes, 20? Or 15? Okay, 15. So I will go, you know, just around it. Tell me when it is 12 or 13 minutes, please. So the conversation I had was about uh, how does the world change around us and because technology changes. And, and one of the questions that came up was, how will autonomous cars change industry as we know it? And the obvious things, you know, some things that, you know, you don't need a driver, you will be less stressed when your spouse is driving, which is pretty good. Uh, and, you know, you don't need RTOs and driving schools and roadside signals, all of them are pretty good. And then we, we moved a little further and we said, well, you know, you don't need uh, pharmaceutical companies will be impacted because doctors will be impacted because, you know, uh, you know, if you don't have to drive in Bangalore, less blood pressure, and, you know, and all of that stuff. Uh, but you just move a little bit further and then uh, somebody pointed out that even surgeons would be impacted and heart surgeons would be impacted. And the question was why? The answer was because, um, you know, heart surgeons work. You know, if you really have to do organ transplants, many organ transplants require a live donor and live donor is not possible. So therefore you, uh, you know, harvest an organ from, you know, an accident victim. If there are no accidents, there are no victims. That is interesting. Or if you go on to the insurance sector, insurance would be impacted, and so on. And while we had this conversation, I was actually talking to somebody uh, from the shipping sector, and they pointed out, and this was not in India elsewhere, they pointed out that the one segment that would really get impacted by autonomous cars would be the alcohol you know, the, the alcohol business. And until then, the connections were very clear, but it was not very clear to me why would beer companies and you know liquor companies be impacted because of, uh, you know, self-driving cars. The answer was really simple. We were, this was in Sweden, and most parts of the world, you can't drink and drive. And they pointed out that if cars drive themselves, then, you know, people can drink and, you know, you know have a good time. So the point really is that there are connections in the industry that we don't see. Innovations lead to new connections, new networks, new businesses, uh, new uh, enterprises of various kinds. And you see all of those innovations happening even now. For instance, if you look at Airbnb, look at um, Ola Caps, you look at uh, you know, many of these businesses. You find traditionally we talked about you know, assets driving business, then we talked about uh, you know, asset light businesses. Today we are talking about uh, you know, no asset businesses. In a way, I mean, that's not really true. There are assets. But business models are changing. Uh, industries are being completely uh, redefined, new leaders are emerging and so on. So in that world, uh, what kind of changes can we expect? So, you know, I just picked up a few examples, but to save time, let me not talk about it. So there are, you know, clearly there are changes in the world, there are consultants who deal with it, and consultants have a tendency to give you models. And being a professor, I have the privilege of copying the best known models and then presenting it to you with my own commentary, and which is what I'm going to do. Basically, if you look at the way the world is changing, many have pointed out there are three or four major trends that you can really, major, not trends, but major, uh, you know, um, aspects that you need to be looking at. One is what we would call as the volatility that exists in the world. And the simple example, if you're looking at, if you're running the aircraft business, <coughs> look at jet fuels, the, uh, you know, fuel prices change frequently. And as it changes, you know, it brings an uncertainty, you know, some kind of volatility into your business. So this is relatively unstable change. You have information, but you know, you cannot predict really always. The second is really a little bit more interesting. Um, so there's volatility, and added to volatility is what you might call as uncertainty. <clears throat> you know some events, you know the causal relationships, but you don't know whether an event will happen, and when an event does happen, what is likely to be the impact. The classic example, Siemens invests a billion dollars in nuclear power, then Fukushima accident happens and they force right off that money. Or, you know, the more recent, you know, question of uh, Brexit, when 
you know, you know Brexit is going to happen. You know, uh, the Brits. We are, nobody knows really whether they want to stay or whether they whether they want to go. But do you know? You do know that that will happen. When that happens, you don't know what the impacts are going to be. There is a great deal of uncertainty, especially if you are from the IT sector, the finance sector. You see those changes. Well, <clears throat> there's a third element that because the world is relatively kind of closely connected, and because these industries are also networked and so on, there is a great element of complexity uh, that is also emerging in today's business. For instance, if you take a business like Walmart, uh, it found that the, the models that you used in the US really did not work in Germany. Uh, you know, a simple example is you know, the, the American associates smiled and talked to the customers, whereas the Germans found uh, you know, smiling and talking to customers or you know, uh, making small talk like, how are you darling today or something was really not, not appropriate in the German uh, you know, mindset. And they, they refused to do that and so on, so many examples. Of course, there are examples closer home or you know, I just always think of the airline industry when you talk about complexity. This is an eight o'clock in the morning shot of the flights that are uh, you know, up in the air at any point of time. This is at eight in the morning and you can see there's a huge amount of interconnectedness and complexity that needs to be managed. There are, of course, uh, more interesting for some and more troublesome for others, events that also happen. Uh, if you consider, uh, you know, uh, events that have no, uh, you know, there is no prior experience to predict what will happen. And I think the election of Trump was a classic example of that. Trump got elected, nobody expected him to be elected, that is uncertain. But the fact that once he was elected, nobody knew what he would do. And, and so there is no prior history. If Clinton were to be elected, then business could have predicted this is what would happen. Uh, you know, and so on. But when, you know, when Trump was elected, there is no prior, uh, you know, experience. The basic rules of the game are not known. <laughs> there is no cause and effect in this case. There's, there are only tweets. And there are, of course, problems. And, you know, there is no reliability. And when Trump tweets, Amazon shares fall by 2.4%. And so many things. You don't, so you don't know which side of the bed is getting out and you know, which business is going to be hit tomorrow and so on. So basically, essentially what I'm saying is that we live in a world which is very much what many people like to call as the VUCA world. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Now the question really for us, and this is a terminology that's used very frequently, the question before us is really how does this impact uh, you know, our strategy? How does it impact business? And I want to step, uh, you know, back one more step and ask the question, why is this happening now? Because that's really important for us to understand. As marketeers, you look at trends, as strategies, you know, as a student of strategy, I also look at trends. And I think, you know, that's probably where the connection is. So if you look at the connections, what is behind the timing? Two or three things, you know, I just wanted to kind of highlight. One, the way markets are evolved. We're talking about globalization. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, business is becoming larger and so on. Uh, and, and of course, the interconnections between business. We are talking about, uh, two, we are talking about the, the worrisome state of the earth. <coughs> you can talk about climate change or biodiversity or, you know, you know, whole range of issues that we are really concerned about. Three, uh, the worrisome at times, and not so worrisome at times, state of technology. Some technologies you don't understand, you really worry. Some, you know, are uh, in, certainly very positive. Some are disrupting business as we know it, and, and so on, remaking business as we know it. And of course, finally, the state of society and politics, which is again uh, undergoing a big kind of turmoil today. If you look at Europe, look at US, look at uh, you know, Middle East, look at India, you find uh, these uh, you know, um, societal values, norms, and practices changing very rapidly. I could go into each of these in some detail, just to point out to you that I did really think about this. This is not just, you know, uh, off the cuff, but given the lack of time, I'm not going to do that, but I'm just showing you one or two data that really uh, highlights uh, these trends. The fact that corporations today control a significant portion of the world's wealth and therefore are under greater scrutiny. The fact that globalization exists in ways that we don't normally visualize. For instance, if you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you can trace it to at least 19 countries, you know, at the origin. Uh, the cup, the, 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 the coffee, the machine, uh, the printing ink, and so on. So you can go on, you know, like that. 
That's also true of the shirt that you would buy at Walmart. That could be traced to a couple of countries at least. If you look at the state of the earth, again, you know, data tells us that we are not in great shape, um, both in terms of population, multiple other things. Uh, in fact, I just picked this up just to highlight that uh, this recent study that was done by Nithi Ayo, which said Bangalore and Delhi will run out of good water by 2020. That is just two years ago, two years down the line. So if you're planning to buy a house, you probably want to rethink. Unfortunately, I bought my house just before this, so it didn't help. <laughs> the third is the state of technology, which again, um, you know, we can talk about a whole range of technologies. Uh, you know, and you know, if you think about communication technologies, which is really what many of you are really talking about, you can actually see uh, the world is really connected in ways that was not possible before. In the old days, it would take uh, maybe three months for a virus to reach uh, from you know, one continent to another, say from New York to New Delhi. In the meantime, the patient would be dead and you would, be under, you, know, you would have nothing to worry about. Today, the same virus will travel from New York to New Delhi or vice versa in 15 hours. And so the flu travels in 15 hours. And if it's an economic flu, it will travel in maybe 15 seconds. And we know this, right? When the Twin Towers fall, Bombay Stock Exchange crashes. So you have a situation that we are not just physically connected, we are also connected virtually. And there is no better example of that than you know when you can talk about social networks and so on. And sometimes you know I joke by saying that the fastest growing country in the world today is Facebook. 2.1 billion users, I think a few million users added every day. And of course, uh, of course, you know, and all the attendant problems associated with that. So we can go on and on about this, uh, about a whole range of new technologies, uh, you know, which one can talk about. But suffice it to say that technologies are really a big piece of the puzzle, and we try, we, we look at the trend. The final part I want to really talk about is the way society has evolved, and you know, uh, once again, you're all marketing people, so I don't really want to talk about millennials versus Generation X versus Y versus Z. They, they, they ran out of alphabets, and now they're talking about Generation Alpha and you know, Gen Beta and Beta they have not reached, Gen Alpha. But the, the fact of the matter is that the, uh, these generations are really generations apart in terms of the values they hold, in terms of uh, you know, uh, the approach, the attitude uh, you know, to work, and you know, all of this stuff. Uh, all of that. And you can see that happening, really. You actually, that's one part of the, uh, the equation, that society is changing. And the other part of the equation, I think, which is really interesting for us as marketeers, is to note that societal values are also changing. In, in some ways, you know, there is some convergence. In some ways. So, uh, you know, move towards transparency or towards, uh, you know, uh, more opposition to corruption, less tolerance of corruption, more uh, gender equity, you know, all of that, LGBT rights, all of this, you can see across the world, even though you find greater polarization, that's a paradox. There is greater polarization in regionally as well as culturally, but on the other hand, there is also greater integration, as some would have pointed out. Uh, a few years ago, we were the MTV generation. Today, we are actually the Twitter generation. And, you know, at some, at some level, you will find they're all very similar, you know, similar kind of values and so on. I use this example simply to illustrate uh, the power of technology and society combining together to take somebody from obscurity to the, the pre position of the Chief Minister of uh, Delhi. So India against corruption movement. So now, when you look at trends, basically what we are saying is that as managers, you really, never really had to deal with this in this complex interactive format. Uh, in the good old days, if you were a manager in the 70s or 80s, you, you dealt with environmental issues. That is what really kind of caught your attention. Uh, in the 90s, probably you looked at the state of markets, we talked about globalization and the impact of globalization, liberalization that, uh, you know, that was kind of unleashed on the Indian economy and so on. And we talked about how do we become globally competitive. But you move forward a few years further and you say, if you look at the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s and you know, so on, uh, and, and the, uh, the early part of this last, late part of the last decade, you will find that it was the age of technology that is really what brings you here and that is really what made India back, back office of the world. And, but it's interesting, if you look at the last decade or this decade, you know, the last few years of this decade, I would argue that it is the age of society and politics. 
you have new political movements, you have, uh, you know, across the world, you know, uh, there is a lot of churning in society that's really happening. Now, if you were a manager in the 70s or 80s, you just bothered about the earth and you really didn't, really, really didn't have to bother about it. But if you're a manager today, you have all of these simultaneously kind of bearing upon you. So as an academic, I find this really interesting. But if you were in the middle of this, I would, you know, I wouldn't want to be managing any business at this stage because essentially you're now dealing with the intersections. And what do I mean by intersection? Intersection, just let me just give you an example. I don't like your company, you know, and they, you know, because I think you, uh, you damage the environment. Now, I could be sitting uh, at my home, be an armchair activist, and organize people, the power of technology. And I will find like-minded people across the world, the power of society and politics. And organize them to put a boycott, you know, to do a boycott against you across the world. That is not possible before. So your vulnerability as businesses increase dramatically. You need to respond very quickly as increased dramatically. So you can see how the world around us is changing and why we need to really look at strategy. I mean, you know, by strategy, I, I'm meaning this in a, in a broad sense. So if you want to lead in tomorrow's world, you have to not just anticipate the trend and the intersection, but you have to manage the intersections. And that's really the skill for tomorrow, and that's the question that you ask, what is it that's required? Just to give you a, a simple example of that, where technology and people mix, you know, I just picked this up from a report for the, that was given to the British government, which looked at the number of jobs in 2030, and you can see none of the jobs that you hold today, you know, uh, would figure in this. In fact, none of, most of these jobs we are not even familiar with, I think. So, so that's how the world is changing. Uh, so, if that's the case, how do we look at the world around us? And lack of time, so I'm not really going to spend a lot of time. But just, you know, I thought I will take one example. Uh, you know, uh, you know, this who done it question, who killed Kodak? Who do you think killed Kodak? Suicide? Homicide? Murder? Okay, so I think the story is really true. It's, it's a bit of everything. It's, it's a perfect who done it, and you can say, that you know, many people were kind of instrumental, but Kodak was also ready to you know, uh, kind of commit suicide. So it's homicide comes suicide. But one way if you look at it, you know, a very simplistic way of looking at it is to say that, well, the mobile phone killed Kodak. And why? Because mobile phones started entering into an arena that Kodak was specializing in, which is basically photography. And today your mobile phone has far more power. In fact, yesterday I think Samsung release the, not the prototype, they just, the next version of Samsung, or one of these mobile phones, has a camera that has 48 gigapixels. So you, I'm not sure what you can do with 48 gigapixel photograph. You know, I'm not sure I want to be seen that close up. But in any case, the point is that the, ca the mobile phone kills the camera. And Kodak could not see it. It's just not the mobile phone, it's digitization and the existing model that Kodak had. Kodak, by the way, was the innovator in the um, camera space. Uh, also in the digital camera space, it had a digital camera in 1979. And uh, it, it had a digital camera again in the late 90s or mid 90s. Uh, but the top management of that company said, how can we sell a camera that does not use a film because we make money selling films, right? So existing business models have to be redone. So sometimes when I talk about this, I'm always reminded, I, I, sometimes wonder that whether many of us are in this position of the Kodak. And what do I mean by, you know, uh, are we like Kodak? For instance, if you look at the mobile phone today, it does everything that you would have used a variety of devices for in the past. Music, gaming, photography, uh, digital diary, and so on and so on. It is, this convergence has destroyed a number of industries. And therefore many industries have changed and moved and so on. But sometimes, what is essential is not visible. For instance, I always joke, uh, you know, that in my first avatar as a traveling salesman, not really uh, salesman, but traveling, I carried a whole, you know, gamut of devices, a, you know, a pager, a digital diary, a, a camera, and, you know, torchlight, an alarm clock, <laughs> the whole range of stuff. And now when I travel, I don't even carry a watch. I carry my mobile phone. 
But then I also point out, in fact, I pointed out once in my class, saying that, well, I still carry something which I need wherever I travel, and that's a mosquito repellent. Uh, then one of the students actually, you know, he's very senior executive from the industry, said, Professor, that's not true. You can get an uh, app that can actually drive away mosquitoes. And he had actually, very coincidentally, he had actually created an app the previous night and uh, put that up on the web. He said, you can go and download it. I don't know whether that works, but the point, when he mentioned that, I actually went into Google search, and I found there were at least, you can't see the numbers there, at least 10,000 such apps. Now, they may not work. Maybe one will work. Maybe it won't work. Maybe it's just... In theory, there is a scientific theory behind it, which I can explain later, but it, it's supposed to work, right? And if that works, the mosquito repellent industry, which is about 1,700 crores in this country, is wiped out. Now look at the mosquito repellent industry, big players, switch on your TV in the evening, you hear them, do, you know, they're, they're desperately innovative. So you have double action, triple action, ban, patch, you know, spray, <laughs> uh, you know, the whole range of things. Every possible innovation of that model they have actually made, but they have not realized one, you know, kind of uh, sleep deprived insomniac uh, software engineer somewhere can actually destroy an entire business. And that's the reality today, and one really needs to look at it. Right? So the real question is really do you have your product moments too? And do you recognize them when you have them? That's not a question that I can answer for you, but it's a question certainly worth asking. Uh, and of course, you know, I can't end on a very dismal note, we're going to leave this video uh, very interesting. If you actually uh, go on YouTube, you find this video on Kodak, uh, you know, one of Kodak's marketing managers, or you know, CEO kind of person, telling that Kodak will not be left behind in 1999, saying, this is digital, we're going digital and so on. It's available on YouTube. You can actually um, look at it. It's quite interesting. They did everything they could, but they couldn't really succeed. But I don't want to leave you on a dismal note. I want to leave you on a you know, nice evening, and you're all you know, upbeat about these awards, and I want to leave you on a happy note. So I would like you to reflect on another company which had exactly the same problems. That company was Fujifilm. The same problem. You know, in fact, Fuji was smaller. But Fuji reacted to the challenge very differently. How did it respond? It said, you know, Kodak said, we make money selling films. Fuji said, well, it's not about films. Films are chemicals on plastic or whatever is that material, right? And we have 200 chemicals. We understand chemicals like nobody does. And chemicals are everywhere, from face creams to medicines to nanoparticle, you know, nanotechnology or whatever. You can, you can just basically use them anywhere. And so they took that core competence and redefined. And Fuji, of course, is certainly one of the best known companies today. Huge amount of innovation. You can't, but you know, these are some of the things they do. Let me leave that, I think, because we're running out of time. But you can see it's in everything. Uh, and all of these basically work on a, the core competence that they, they look at, right? So the real question for you as marketeers is, when you have a Kodak moment, would you recognize it? And will you be a Fujifilm? Thank you.